please put your hands together for a beautiful soul, Jessica Loftus, as she tells her story, my mother had beautiful hands. So Emily told me before this that you should never get up and start your performance with an apology, and I kind of disagree. <laughs> um, so my story's a real downer, but it's a really good story. So after all of your adorable laughter, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you have Kleenexes? Because that might be really helpful. So this is the story about how I lost my mother. I didn't have a typical childhood. My mother was very proud of her Sioux Indian and Norwegian heritage, and she spent her childhood and her adolescence in the interior of Mexico. My mother was a very powerful seer. It was very hard to lie to her. And she trained me to also be a seer. When other children had tea parties and played with dolls, we went antiquing and she taught me to feel energy, to think multidimensionally and think into other lifetimes and think cyclically. My mother taught me to think about unspoken conversation and feel into other lifetimes. She would have me do this exercise where I would stand in the backyard and she would have me outstretch my hands with the sun in my face and ask me to think about all of the other things that had occurred in that space and time that were no longer and teach me to understand that sound and time are infinite and all of these stories are still concurrently happening. I, I was not a normal child. I'm, I'm not a normal adult, whatever that means. Um, we, we would sit and talk into late into the night about ancient life, the origin of deception and religion, often the same thing, the nuances of love and suffering, and the way to see through things that people were both saying and not saying. The rest of my family are dissociative geniuses and I don't say that lightly. They were famous for not least listening and being completely involved in their own intellects. My mom was the black sheep and the squeaky wheel. And I think that what I really want you to understand through this story is that not all seers are joyous people. Some seers are made, some are grown, some come to their sight through wounding, and some come to their wounding through their sight. Some people, some seers, begin to self-medicate in order to protect themselves. They protect themselves and temper the noise of inauthentic love, disempowerment, and consequently giving their power away. My mother began to self-medicate, dimming her power from being dismissed by her family and by her marriage. I watched knowing everything that was happening and desperately trying to change it. So most days of my teenage years were spent wondering whether or not today was the day that my mother would successfully end her life. Since I was the only one who understood what was happening because she had trained me to, it was more difficult, 100% more difficult for me than it was for everyone around me. She became more depressed and we talked often about her decision to end her life. I could feel the time speeding up when she would. And as I turned 17, I got my first job, so I got a job in a mortuary because that seemed to make the most sense for my life. It was where I fit in to live between the veil and he help people through their confusion and their nightmare. So I had this interesting experience whereby at work, I experienced the finality of people's storylines. But when I went home, I experienced still this chaos, this white noise of a storyline that had yet to meet its completion. So as no one was listening and were involved in their passive aggression, histrionics, and dissociation, you, you guys know, you have this in your family, don't you? <laughs> don't you have one person that's always trying to get everybody to see what's happening and nobody's interested? So she was tempering the data, silencing her own song, and giving away her power to my father my senior year was her first suicide attempt. She took over 2,000 milligrams of a prescription called Dilantin that's a, uh, a, an, an epileptic drug, and she was not an epileptic. 
So she chose to come lay down in my bed, which in retrospect I've always thought was for comfort. I don't think that she meant to traumatize me. But as the universe would see fit, it switched the, the storyline. My dog figured out that there was something wrong with her and woke my grandfather up, who rushed her to the hospital and they pumped her stomach. And that was six weeks before I graduated. So the next morning in the glaring New Mexico sun, we were sitting at our teeny little table in our dining area and my very histrionic martyr of a grandmother had purchased orange juice and Dunkin' Donuts to normalize the situation because that's what you do. And I, I, I was the only one being the squeaky wheel and begging everyone at the table to at least talk about what we had just experienced. Here I was, seven, seven, 17, about to graduate, and sitting in a waiting room waiting for them to pump my stomach while Barney the dinosaur played on the television in the waiting room. I mean, w what a horrible, surreal situation. So I looked at my grandfather and my grandmother and my mother with her charcoal-stained, purplish lips from uh, having her stomach pumped. And I said, are we at least going to talk about what just happened? And my grandmother looked at me dryly, out of a film she could have been, and she said, we are never going to talk about it. Do you understand me? You are never going to talk about this. So I wasn't allowed to tell my brother, and I wasn't allowed to tell my friends. And I walked around with this weight on me, going to work in a mortuary, graduating from high school, dealing with my mother, who was desperately trying to speed up her time frame and, and her life. So shortly thereafter, when my mother found some balance, we sat down and had a very difficult conversation. And I asked her to reconsider. And you have to remember, I was completely fluent in all of her thoughts and all of her emotions, and I was the only one who was. It's not that I didn't know the plot line. So when I asked her to please reconsider, she said, you know I can't do that. And when I asked why, she said, no exaggeration guys, I, I swear to God this is my life. <laughs> she said, because I've given so much of my power away that I'm not even myself anymore, and the only way for me to become a good mother and a guide to you for everything that you're supposed to experience in this life and everything that you'll do and everything that you'll achieve is for me to move on. We both know I can't repair my body. We both know I can't repair this situation. So I need you to know that it's soon. It will be soon. And you're the one who's going to have to be prepared. Man, other kids were like going to parties and learning to drink. You know, I never smoked a cigarette. <laughs> like, <laughs> just waiting and waiting and waiting. So the day that she finally succeeded, I called the mortuary very calmly and informed my coworkers that they'd be receiving my mother's body soon. And it was so surreal. Everyone around me was enraptured with their their drama and pretending that it was an accident and they just couldn't believe what had befell Sarah. And I was looking around and noticing that for the first time in a decade that there was a quiet in my soul, that I could finally feel her again. So because I worked there and I conducted my mother's funeral, I made all of the plans, I made the very painful decision that I would have her cremated. And I thought about all of my coworkers, whom I loved and loved me dearly. And I thought that it was cheating the experience that I'd had with my mother for 19 years at that point to have somebody else do her hair and makeup and sit with her. So I elected to do it. And all of my friends were very concerned about me. And I wasn't. I think that I made the most sober, conscious, collective decision that I possibly could because n nobody else had been very informed about how this story had coalesced. So one of the most bittersweet, beautiful experiences that I will have in this lifetime, nothing will top this, was doing my mother's cat eyes, as only I could do, <laughs> and in drawing the eyeliner on her eyes, watching her eyes move to my touch, 
drawing her mascara on and watching her eyelashes move, and her lips move to my touch when I drew her lipstick on. And it was as if I had her back. The white noise and the chaos was finally gone. And I felt my bond again with, with my intuitive mother. So I knew I had three days until the cremation time was scheduled. So I just chose to spend it with her. Because each time that I went home, I was surrounded by people that were playing out their victimhood and their wounding, and they weren't owning anything of their co-creation in this story. So I chose to just stay there with her. So I held my mother's hand for three days as much as I could, and I had this really powerful, beautiful experience of watching the blood begin to pool in her fingertips. And I understand the beauty of watching not just a consciousness and a soul begin to fade from this lifetime, but the way in which the body begins to reflect its experience. The quiet becomes quieter, and the void becomes larger and more vast. And as her skin began to change colors, I felt a peace that they would not. And I got an opportunity to make my mother a great deal of promises. And I, f I feel that I'm still doing a very good job at those. And I promise to always hear the conversations that are not being spoken, to always hear people's hurts and your truths, and to be able to discern between what is true and untrue. I think that the most powerful thing that we can do for each other is truly listen to what's being said versus what's not being said. And if you get an opportunity to hold someone's hand whom you love more than anything while they cross between one veil to the next, you, you need to grasp that beauty and be more painfully honest and authentic with each other than you think you're capable of because you are capable. We're all capable of being there for each other in a more authentic way.